neurologist who has been using vitamin D in high doses to treat patients with multiple sclerosis. And his observations were that even other autoimmune diseases were getting some solution, some resolution at the same time. And that's what led me to visit him, learn under his guidance, and realize the powerful role that vitamin D plays in the immune system. So it helps to promote that shift from grossly TH1 to TH2, and it has a very intelligent role to play in the immune system. It doesn't suppress it completely, but knows which aspect of it needs to be suppressed and which need not be. So it promotes the T regulatory cells, and suppresses the TH17 activity, which plays a major role in the genesis of autoimmune disorders. So it strikes the right balance between the T regulatory and the TH17 cells. Well, vitamin D, now I realize that when I see patients, I sort of compartmentalize my mind. Is it for supplemental purpose or is it for a therapeutic purpose when it comes to dealing with autoimmune disorders? Because my own journey has led me to a point where I'm having patients with all sorts of autoimmune disorders coming for some solution when they are literally stuck. And what I learned from Dr. Coimbra is that there is a high degree of resistance at the VDR in patients with autoimmune disorders. So what are the clinical implications of that is that the requirement of vitamin D goes up. It's not the same as the supplemental doses that we commonly talk of or commonly prescribe. And this is a very wonderful uh, publication in literature, how vitamin D resistance is the possible cause of autoimmune disorders and the mandate and need for giving higher than usual doses of vitamin D. So, it's not only deficiency of vitamin D, it's resistance due to genetic polymorphisms that form the two reasons of the need for giving vitamin D to people with various autoimmune disorders. So Dr. Coimbra gave these very salient points that vitamin D is an immunoregulator and resistance is there because of genetic polymorphisms. And the point number three, to compensate for the resistance to its effects, higher levels of vitamin D are needed and has to be taken on a daily basis. Because the half-life of vitamin D inside the immune cells mm -hmm. is much less than the half-life in blood. So it has to be sort of sustained inside the immune cells. Hence the requirement of daily need of giving vitamin D. And it's not a one size fit for all mm -hmm. protocol. It has to be individualized, it has to be personalized, it has to be customized because every individual has a different degree of vitamin D resistance. So the clinical parameters used to decide the dose is the fall or drop in the levels of PTH and two, monitoring the calcium because hypercalcemia, which definitely becomes, you know, more possible when higher doses are given, has to be kept a check upon. So under no circumstances it should happen. Therefore, many times we withdraw the calcium supplements the patients are taking and rather give them magnesium along with it. So this was a study published by his team where they gave 35,000 international units of vitamin D daily for six months to a group of nine patients with psoriasis and eight with vitiligo. And they found good results. Sup suppression of the psoriatic manifestations. So this was published in 2013. The dose use was 35,000 and of course the same monitoring principles were followed and hypercalcemia was prevented and there was no side effect observed when this protocol was followed. Well, I'm not going to get into this. PTH suppression is a very important parameter as a clinician to be followed. So when patients come, we check not only their D levels, but PTH, ionized calcium, and we repeat it after two months, one month, depending upon the clinical situation, and see how much is the drop in PTH when vitamin D has been started. And if the drop is inadequate, the vitamin D dose can be increased depending upon the clinical situation. 
So PTH suppression is the index of vitamin D utilization. That how much the body is using rather than just the levels of vitamin D. So if PTH levels are not dropping, the body is not making proper use of vitamin D due to the resistance. And of course, it has to be dealt with individually. The fear of toxicity comes in mind and no better review than Dr. Hollick's review in the Mayo Clinic proceedings that there is enough evidence that vitamin D toxicity is one of the rarest medical conditions and it is typically due to in intentional or inadvertent intake where the doses are more than 50,000 to 1 lakh units per day for months to years and most important without monitoring for hypercalcemia. Other things given to the patients were of course minerals, vitamins and yes none of the patients in my study were taking any steroids or any immunosuppressant going on. So this is the case series which I'm going to quickly share with you. This one is six patients right based on the same principles and uh, I think I'll directly go to them. The doses used as you can see here I started with 30,000 international units per day and one of them required even going up to 60,000 international units per day. I'm going to just show you how it went ahead. We saw significant, significant control of psoriasis in all of them over a period of two to six months. And we measured it through PASI score and a visual analog scale at the same time. So this was case number one, a lady with <coughs> psoriasis vulgaris and a long history. So when she came, uh, we, as I said, we put around 30,000 units of vitamin D daily for two months. The PTH levels were, you can see it here, they were more than 37.5. So they came down to this level, indicating a response, but same time there was significant clinical improvement. So instead of giving her more vitamin D, we started bringing it down and got it to 25,000 IUs per day. The calcium was monitored, indicating normal calcemia. And within three months, you can see how the lesions, which were like this before, were almost 80% normalized within three months. And the PASI score improved, itching went away. And right now, she's on a maintenance dose of 20,000 international units per day, with PTH ionized calcium being regularly monitored and doing pretty good. The second case, another senior lady who came with uh, palmoplantar psoriasis, and her vitamin D levels at the onset were 45 nanogram per ml, which is good, right? But the PTH was still not near the lowest rate, 15 to 65. So we gave her same 30,000 dose for a period of three months. PTH levels came down to 21. They never went below 15, all right? That's signifying the vitamin D resistance. Calciums remained within the range and she showed a complete control. You can see how beautifully the skin has improved. And right now, she's on a dose of 15,000 IUs daily and maintaining a same healthy skin and the blood levels are also being monitored. She was a little challenging case. She had it on the entire body. You can see the face, limbs and arms. And although when we started, yes, her levels were very low. Her vitamin D level was 9 nanogram per ml. So we had to give her that loading dose. So after giving a loading dose, she was put on 30,000. And uh, yes, she did not show much improvement. So we had to take the vitamin D dose to 45,000 IUs per daily max dose. And then there was this actually a miraculous recovery. She is so indebted to vitamin D. Her skin is almost 99% normal. So she required 45,000 for a couple of months, but now she's on around 15,000 international units per day and maintaining her skin normal, neutral. A doctor by profession, whole body psoriasis vulgaris, he responded very quickly to 30,000 international units and he's doing pretty good. Now I'll show you the another girl with palmoplantar psoriasis. She responded to very low dose. She did very well with just a month of 30,000 and immediately was reduced to 15,000 IUs daily. And right now she's taking 7,500 IU units per day and maintaining her skin healthy. So the message I realized was they need that initial kick, the initial correction. And then after monitoring, got them down to a maintenance level. We need not give the same high dose to them throughout whole life. 
and this was a challenging case. This lady, a Spanish, sorry, a Mexican origin from the US, one sec. Yeah. Whole body psoriasis, it's more on the palms, limbs, you can see how bad they were, and that's the look now. And she was not responding very well to 30,000 and her BMI was high. So initially itself, I increased the dose to 40,000 a day. This marker is not working. 40,000 I used per day. Not much response, although she was being monitored. Increased to 50,000 I used per day. And somehow she was, uh, she had a mindset that she had read a lot about it because this methodology is pretty popular in the United States and the West. So she was bold enough Doctor, please increase my dose. So we took her up to max 60,000 IUs a day with monitoring of the PTH, all in range, ionized calcium, and then the response started coming. She was a diabetic too with hypothyroidism as well. And uh, once the skin improved under all the monitoring, we brought her down to a maintenance dose of 40,000 per day. She got a relapse. She got a relapse. Probably her vitamin D requirement is more. And now we had to again give her more doses. And right now she is on 70,000 IUs per day and her skin has become 80% better. So these doses are very difficult to digest for a common mind. But it's all about dealing with the vitamin D resistance and the problems. All right, so observations were very interesting. At the same time, there are only six cases, but I have the data of right now 108 patients more in front of you. They're all my own patients with psoriasis. And uh, these are few of them because honestly, database of patients is immense the way they come with their problems. So here it's not been studied absolutely statistically, but definitely we have seen that there has been a good response. And we see that almost 30% patients have they say that their skin has improved by 90%. So I'll go on to the next slide to make it easy. These were the preliminary observations looking at my own data retrospectively. Good remission above 90-95% in 30% of patients, which is significant. And 50% improvement is there in others. There is partial relief and they are very motivated to continue. Very, very motivated because they see the results happening. And if nothing else, we are control, able to control the progression of the problem and precipitation of any other autoimmune disease that can happen in a predisposed personality. So this literally prompts us to look into this methodology, do more studies, and I honestly look for collaboration and support because this data of patients is there, just need to make it more uh, you know, with more markers, inflammatory markers, and take the study further ahead. Another patient of mine, you can see how beautifully he has responded. And this is a very recent publication in literature, safety data in patients with autoimmune diseases during treatment with high dose of vitamin D3, according to Coimbra protocol. And the dose variable used, not only 30,000, even taking it to above more than 1 lakh international units per day, more than one lakh international units per day uh, in patients with MS. That's what the general observation is, multiple sclerosis. The vitamin D resistance is higher and the requirement of vitamin D is more than other autoimmune disorders which he's been doing it. And the doses he starts them on is 300 to 1000 international units of vitamin D per kg body weight per day. So. 300 to 1,000 are used per day. With this, I will actually uh, uh, stop my talking because I'm very passionate about this. It has changed my line of work. In fact, I have found a calling in my work now. The way I see the suffering of people with autoimmune disorders, it's very difficult. And if you are able to bring even that 30, 40, 50% relief to their lives, it's a big role we can play as clinicians and physicians, because vitamin D is a necessity in today's time. I feel that all said and done, we can never become farmers like our ancestors. 
So either we take it or then we land up with problems and nobody wants to take medicines. And finally, it doesn't do any harm as Hippocrates says, wherever there is, wherever the art of medicine is loved, there is also a love for humanity. Thank you very much for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you.